Ace Podcast. Hey, this is David Allen from Confession Radio Podcast, and you're listening to Vaguely Accurate on the Ace Podcast Network. Hello everyone, and welcome to Vaguely Accurate, the only science show out there showcasing the work of early career researchers. Have you ever wondered or questioned the origins of the universe? Are you curious about the beginnings of our solar systems? Well, if you are, then you should definitely check out this week's episode. Luke Daly is a planetary scientist, or a cosmic geochemist, investigating the start of our solar systems by measuring the chemical composition of meteorites. He just finished his PhD at Curtin University under the mentorship of Phil Bland and he is also part of the Desert Fireball Network which has started or initiated the Fireballs in the Sky Citizen app. There are links to everything in the description of the podcast so I strongly encourage you to check them out. Before we start the episode I'd briefly like to say that if you enjoy what we offer then please subscribe to us, rate and review on our show on iTunes. It really does help. You may also be interested to check out the other fantastic shows under the ACE Podcast Network. If you'd like to feature on an upcoming episode of Vaguely Accurate, then please get in contact with us via vaguecomments at gmail.com or submit a form upon our website of vaguelyaccurate.com. So yeah, um, I'm, my name's Luke Daly. Um, I'm, well, I've just submitted my PhD at Curtin University um, and will be starting my postdoc, uh, my first postdoc position in, at the University of Glasgow on May the 1st, so very soon. Um, so yeah, um, I've been part of the Desert Fireball Network, um, largely as sample analysis. So Desert Fireball Network is a great project, uh, which is putting cameras all out across the Australian outback. Yeah. Um, and the idea is to track fireballs uh, or shooting stars, or big shooting stars, as they come through the sky with um, several cameras and triangulate where they land and go get them. Um, Had any success with that? Yeah, so um, over the last, ooh, just over a year, we found two. One landed, one we found on New Year's Eve, um, mm-hmm. uh, which is called Marilli. And one was uh, found um, on, well, it fell on Halloween. So, oh, okay. uh, so we, we seem to be landing, to yeah, landing on a significant pagan holidays. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Don't look into too much superstition with that one. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so I so I don't do much well any of the um, camera triangulation, mm-hmm. orbit calculation, all the really sort of cool, complicated mathematical stuff. I'm trying to avoid uh, asking you too yeah, much about um, that. I I'm a geologist uh, by training. Did my undergraduate degree um, at Imperial College London. Yep. Um, and so came here as basically like the one of the people who's going to be looking at the meteorites we find. So I've been part of characterizing both. Uh, the Murilli um, meteorite and the Dingle Dell meteorite that we found. Um, and aside from that, because characterizing two rocks does not make a whole PhD, no, especially as that was a big team collaborative effort with um, <laughs> <laughs> tens of researchers from all around the planet, people doing osmium isotopes, uh, sorry, oxygen isotopes, people doing, yeah, anything yeah. you can imagine to characterize this meteorite and nail down. What is the purpose it is. to find out where it came from, or what is the application of once we've got this rock in hand? Yeah, so for the most part, meteorites we don't know where they came from. There's tens of thousands of meteorites in collections, such as the Smithsonian or the Natural History Museum. Yeah, um, got quite a big collection here in the West Aust- Museum of West Australia. Um, but out of those tens of thousands, we only know where maybe 20, 30 of them came from in the solar system. So that's oh, meteorites wow. that we have orbits for. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the big deal about what we can do with this Desert Fireball Network is not only get this rock, characterize it like we would any other meteorite, we can then track it back to potentially a parent asteroid and start building up an idea of the distribution of these meteorites and their parent bodies uh, in the solar system. So which... Um, would that give us a greater understanding of, I suppose, the materials and minerals that are out there and where they are? Is Absolutely. That that? Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, the analogy we tend to use is, um, say you've got someone dumps 10,000 rocks from all across Australia in your backyard. Yeah. And then tells you to 
to sort out the geological history of how Australia formed. You're going to have a good Sunday. You're going to have, yeah. Um, well, you'll need several beers to come up with any <laughs> yeah. um, any interpretations. Um, but what, so what we're doing is going, at least tying back a few of those meteorites, going, okay, this one came from the Kimberley, or this one came from yeah. uh, Albany, and so those rocks are different. We can start building up this little jigsaw puzzle kind of we would as, as a geological map but on the scale of the solar system which is cool yeah. and so but the thing is we don't really know what we're going to find are we going to find uh, stratigraphy so finding certain meteorites are in certain orbits or certain meteorite classes or are they all mixed up um in the solar system uh um, at the moment because we've only got 30 and of those we found six okay. total over the so while i've been here we found two yeah there's been i'm gonna get it wrong here uh, <laughs> one, two, three, four, five. Because the American branch of our network found another one. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to get that wrong. Another, yeah. Once we've got all these rocks, and once we get enough of them to build up that string, we can really target um, missions. So, like, mm -hmm. uh, NASA spends several billion dollars to send um, things like the Osiris Rex mission to an asteroid. To bring back samples. Um, I've heard about the Osiris Rex. Is, is that literally just like a geological rock gathering? <laughs> it's doing like? a whole bunch of stuff. And okay. um, although, uh, so Phil, uh, my supervisor, for my PhD, is on that um, as part of the team That's pretty driving that, which is awesome. And so, I, and unfortunately, I, I, I'm a lowly PhD, so I don't, I don't pretend to know the ins and outs. But <laughs> yeah. um, the idea is to go to this asteroid, take lots of images of it analyze it from various different angles um, with a bunch of instruments and then one of the final phases uh, of the mission is to drop a lander which basically uh, attaches itself to the asteroid um, kicks up some dust and catches that yep. into a container and that container gets blasted back towards earth um, mm. and so we can basically get fresh material from an asteroid uh, which is awesome um I uh, think that's only been happened maybe once or twice before. Um, and then the movie Armageddon. And yeah, the movie Armageddon, that was an important one yeah, <laughs> for us. Uh, yeah. Historical event. <laughs> Historical event. Definitely not. Um, followed up by The Martian, obviously, so it's great that we've now been to Mars. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's always, I mean, always same, good. Same level. <laughs> conspiracy moon landing, but the conspiracy yeah, yeah. Mars landing. Yeah, we definitely yeah. didn't go to the moon, but Mars is definitely happening. Oh, that's because happening. We put, um, imagine all the money that uh, NASA's spent getting... Um, What's his name? Matt Damon back from know, <laughs> various places in the universe. Of all the um, legendary astronomers and astronauts <laughs> we have, Matt Damon Matt was Damon. clearly the obvious yeah. choice. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder how many people will take that seriously, what we just said. Hopefully none. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so much hopefully yeah. none. All good, all good. <laughs> but with the fireballs, like I've heard a lot about it from volunteering with Renee and stuff. Mm. Can you, it's partnered with NASA now, right? Yeah. And yeah. it's got a citizen science... I'm doing a plug-in here for you guys. So yeah. If you didn't guess it. Um, <laughs> but it's got like a citizen science initiative going alongside it. Yeah. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, I think that's one of the most... If not the most important things we do, aside from pushing back the um, frontiers of our knowledge, is engaging with the general public and going like, hey, look, we found this really cool thing. Um, and to inspire that so... The fact that NASA are now on board is amazing because that gives us a whole other platform um, and their media machine can churn into gear, which is um, like way beyond the resources that you have as a, just an academic. They've got a lot invested into it. I'm going to take a long shot on that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, no, it's awesome. And so that gives us a much wider reach to get people interested in planetary science and the kind of stuff we're doing. Just found out that like, Renee is doing, like, making it global now or worldwide? Yeah, in some yeah. Respect? So we just got a big, um, or two big grants from the Australian Research Council yeah. basically going to take it beyond Australia and That's basically incredible. carpet um, places like Morocco, uh, other deserts, mm. um, desert regions with our cameras. There's now four in the UK as well. We That's may awesome. find something, um, uh, but it, as soon as you start putting it in those kind of areas, the reason we chose Australia is Australia is largely barren, desert, red. Mm -hmm. Meteorites, mm -hmm. for the most part, are black rocks. Um, so little black rock on a, on a red background is very easy to spot. Little black rock in deciduous forest in the middle of Europe. Slightly hard to spot. No, it's slightly hard to spot. Um, but though people have 
uh, managed to do that. Um, there's camera networks Good in work. France, uh, in the Czech Republic, in Finland, in Canada, and they have had um, some successes finding uh, finding Mishra, it's that way. Um, wow. So if you wanted to get involved with that, it's just an app, Fireballs in the Sky, right? So yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that's, that's, a, that's a branch of, of the Desert Problem Network is going, yeah. okay, we can't have cameras everywhere. Um, get there are else to become the cameras. Close to, uh, well, just over 7 billion people on the planet nowadays, right? So if everyone has that app and they see a shooting star, they can use this app to triangulate what they saw um, very easily in the app. Um, yeah. And if enough people see it, uh, we can get reasonable triangulations just off um, people's people, smartphones, really, <laughs> which is which is amazing. Which is a fantastic um, example of the power of what the citizen science can do. Like, yeah, exactly. You can't just like, oh, here's a photo of a marine mammal and you just yeah. send it off. It's uh, you're interpreting an intra- the mm. trajectory of something that was there now is not. So it's yeah, absolutely. Um, and in fact, our last meteorite, the Dingle Dell. Um, each right, uh, we were alerted to it um, by uh, a citizen scientist out um, out that way, That's awesome. uh, and so we got the ding from our app saying, "Oh, someone's reported an app." Uh, basically, before our cameras had a chance to during the day churn through all the photos and t- tell us yeah. that it had seen it, um, which is really cool. That's really um, cool. Where did the name Dingle Dale come from? I've got to ask it. I mean, it Can't makes you. me really happy when we found. So, meteorites nomenclature and how they're named um, is a very sort of dogmatic, almost <laughs> bureaucratic system, um, and it for the most place on the planet, it's it's named after the location of the nearest place with a post office. In Australia, there aren't many distributed. So you've got these large swathes of land um, and maybe like one post office. So mm-hmm. you'd end up having a bunch of meteorites all called the same thing if you had that nomenclature. Yeah. And because our meteorites have orbits, they're kind of a bit more special. So we want to give them a unique name. Um, so, for example, all the astro- all the meteorites that are found in Antarctica get given uh, names like Allen Hills or ALH. Um, meteorites that land in Morocco or the northwest African uh, peninsula are. Oh. Uh, so the room's just falling apart around us. It's just great. <laughs> um, called NWAs. Um, they all have like a string of numbers after that. So because this one's got an orbit, we want to have it a unique name. So we named them after the nearest geographical feature. And yep. so this happened to be uh, the Dingle Dell, um, I think it was like allotment or. Um, Fantastic air That's region, which is okay. just like really, really um, interesting. So, and then really was a because it landed in the middle of Katitanda uh, Lake Air. So um, we were really lucky because um, part of that lake is uh, sort of a indigenous Australian uh, mm-hmm. Aboriginal land, and so we had two guys take us out onto the lake, show us the correct places to go without sinking into the um, oh, that mud, That's always um, good and uh, they were. We basically asked them, hey, what is what is the name of this area we found the meteorite in? Like, mm. um, what do you call it? And the Marilli was... Marilli. What? That's uh, fantastic. They, uh, they had a um, congregation of their elders and decided, yeah, that, that so that was the name of that area. And so we were like, yeah, no, done. That's fantastic. Um, What's the difference <coughs> between a meteorite and a meteor, I must ask? Oh, me- so, yeah. Um, so there's kind of three main things. A meteoroid is out there in the solar system. Yep. Flying around. A meteor is the light as it burns up through the atmosphere. Yeah, so so it's purely is just the light. Just the light. Um, okay. And a meteorite is a meteoroid that's hit the Earth. Yeah, so as soon as it hits, right here. It's, yeah, so yeah. as soon as it's hit the Earth, it's a meteorite. The meteor is the light you see in the sky, and a meteoroid is when it's before it lands is on Is there it. a term for it, for the actual meteor, I suppose? That's not the light, the rock itself? Is there a... Hmm. I suppose it would... I'm going to, the terminology I'm going to Google like this afterwards and find out I'm completely be... wrong. But I think it would still be a meteoroid until it hits the ground. Okay, that makes Which sense. Which is always something I made, made me wonder. is like, hey, what if you caught it? <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't technically hit the ground. <laughs> um, what would a... that be? Yeah. It's an interesting like, concept of this nomenclature yeah. and I mean, good kind of how interesting well. it is that these sort of like almost traditional historic ways of naming things has come about and you could always like... Get a loophole. Get a loophole mm-hmm. through it, yeah. I think it's a good time as ever to jump to our sponsor. Vaguely accurate supports Sabre. 
There are no-kill group engaged in the rescue, rehabilitation, rehoming, and responsible ownership of Staffordshire Bull Terriers and Bull Breed Dogs, including crossbreeds. Dogs come into their care from pounds, private surrenders, vets, or other rescues, and are cared for by volunteers in our foster care program until suitable homes are found. They have no shelter of their own and rely on foster homes to house the majority of their dogs. Sabre became a deductible gift charity in July 2013 and with no government funding, they rely solely on the generosity of the public, their volunteers and the public organisations. If you'd like to check them out and see what else they do, they're a fantastic group. I'm actually a foster carer for them and I'll be posting on our social media the dogs that come through. Anyway, let's get back to the show. I think we should use that and segue back to you and why <laughs> your postdoc and your PhD and your whole journey. Mm. So you, what made you do the transition from UK to Australia is an important one. Yeah, so that was, uh, I guess, one of those... One of the things I think about planetary science is very serendipitous. Mm. So very requires a lot of luck. So finding meteorites, even in Australia, requires a bit of luck. You've got yeah. to be paying attention at the right time, not worrying about the flight, not worrying about the dollar. So... Um, I was just finishing my undergrad uh, at Imperial College, um, sort of debating what to do next. Uh, I'd done sort of like a master's project as well on top of that. And my supervisor at the time, uh, Professor Mark Sefton, uh, still at Imperial College London, yeah. uh, I had a project with him looking at uh, these hydrothermal vents in Morocco. Okay. Um and under, so I was the water hydrothermal or no. So they were surface. sitting. Um, okay. They were they used to be underwater. Mm-hmm. Um, now, uh, sort of three hundred million years ago, now uh, they're sitting above the land in sort of perfectly preserved coral reef structures, which just stick out of the ground. It's like it's a gorgeous place. Where is that in Morocco? Uh, a little pl- little town called Erfurt. So um, it's one of my favourite places on the planet. Just because it's go there. beautiful. Can, can I go there? It's not like. I mean, when I came back, there was something about, on, I think on the French um, government website, it's like, oh, this is a Al-Qaeda hotspot. Oh, um, yeah. But yeah. when we were there, we never saw anything. It was fine. Um, I mean, and like, it's on the border, direct border of the Sahara Desert. So, oh, um, cool. yeah. Uh, right next to Tatooine. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and the border with Algeria, too. Um, so, I mean, like, it's like, like with any new country you go to, you've got to keep your wits about you. Yeah. There are places in every country oh, of course. that you don't like Glasgow, do. Go. Like, no, Glasgow's really nice. <laughs> <I think. laughs> Nothing wrong with Glasgow. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, yeah, it's nice place. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, and kind of the fallout of that project, yeah, we got some really interesting results basically showing that they weren't hydrothermal vents like everyone had thought previously. And so we were going like, okay, let's, I'll do a PhD in that, figure out how all that works, look at the global distribution of these things, see if there's any more we can find um, Mm -hmm. that fit this bill. And that'd be a really nice um, PhD project. Yeah. Um, And which is kind of funny because it's nothing to do with planetary science. It was mostly paleontology, uh, so looking at fossils, structural geology, looking how rocks, the rocks are fractured and how these fluids are migrating and organic geochemistry. Uh, none of which I currently do. <laughs> um, so um, basically, in a roundabout way of saying um, that, um, my uh, colleague at the time, uh, co-worker, oh, sorry, co-worker, fellow student at Imperial yeah. College, uh, Lucy Foreman, who also um, did a PhD uh, with us. I hope we'll be talking to her. I hope to be um, the soon. soon. Um, she's been doing some awesome, awesome work. But yeah, uh, so she was, Principal Blunt was her mentor at our time in Imperial. And basically, like, uh, they had a chat um, at the end of her master's project and was mm. like, oh, okay, um, what are you planning to do next? And she was like, oh, I don't know, maybe go into mine, maybe want to do a PhD. And it's like, oh, funny you should mention that. Um, kind of the right <laughs> I've, got, place, I've right just got time. a grant to come to Australia, uh, mm. and there are four PhD slots. Do you want one? Ellie's got the other, and does Luke want one? That's uh, <laughs> talk about luck in and, the field. That uh, in itself is yeah. So it was kind of this ridiculous conversation that I then had with Lucy, uh, when she sort of like called me up and said, "Hey, uh, do you want to talk about this?" Offered, like I've just been offered something. Let's have a chat, and it took us about sort of like five seconds to five minutes to be like, 
this is something we cannot turn down. That's incredible. Um, yeah, the chance to like move to a new country, be part of this awesome project. Yeah. Um, and like studying the early solar system and the origins of the Earth and uh, all the other celestial bodies was just. I mean, I obviously felt really bad because uh, first Mark Sefton did wonders for me in like building me up into the sort of like proto academic uh, world. Um, so it was like a really hard decision to turn down that PhD, which I'd already got to be like, no, I'm going to go to the other side of the world yeah. um, and sort of roll the dice and hope it works out. And it has And it's fantastic. Like, I've been um, seeing a lot of what's been going on in that field, especially here. And it's, yeah, it's yeah. It's pretty um, pro- proliferant as a mm, research group, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a really exciting group to be a part of. Like, I'm devastated that I'm going to be leaving it, even though at the same time being super excited about moving to Glasgow University to working with uh, Lydia Hallis and Martin Lee um, on like looking at water um, yeah. in meteorites, which is going to be Is that where you're great. going to? Yes. Yeah, so you're yeah. looking at water in meteorites and whether they've had water on it, the, the source, I suppose, it came from. Yeah, yeah, which is an interesting sort of like diversion for what I've been doing currently. So my sort of main research focus has been early solar system, early nebula processes. Mm. So when the sun first started shining, what were those first mineral phases to form and what can they tell us about the environment then? Yeah. So now it's like going almost like to the other end, like once you've formed a planet or planetary embryo and you've got percolating fluids, how do they affect the chemistry of those very first minerals? Huh. Um, both, and so I'll be looking at Martian meteorites, which have been affected, uh, called narcolites, which have been affected by um, hydrothermal fluids on Mars, which is really exciting um, so going sort of back like, to your roots yeah well. going back to my roots of like hydrothermal fluids and um, also then a group of meteorites called the CM meteorites um, which have also been uh, significantly affected by water so all their minerals have been altered down to like clays mm-hmm. um, and just seeing what we can get at um, those kind of processes and so because they're the building blocks that you then smash those together and start building planets yeah if we know that how they've been affected so we can get a better idea about so you've gone yeah. from being a geologist which you kind of still are i suppose for all intents and purposes yeah more of a space geologist yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> you've gone from a geologist moved over to australia and you were doing your phd looking and postdoc i suppose mm-hmm. um looking at the sort of mineral composition of the rocks that meteorites that have landed over here mm-hmm. and uh, pretty much assessed where they've come from the conditions that they were formed and now yeah. you're moving into looking at the water based meteorites and or not water based but yeah. meteorites influenced by water and assessing how they have come to form and all that kind of thing. yeah Is that correct to say? yeah pretty much yeah no um so it's a we, kind of interesting journey it is, really <laughs> so when you went back with um you said you know um imaging three rocks does not make a phd and yeah. postdoc i suppose <laughs> so what else have you been using your time with so, so like I, yeah, like I was saying, um, I've been focusing on the very early solar system. So looking at trying to find the mineral phase that formed first. So just the sun starts shining, the mineral phases that formed then can tell us about the temperature, the pressure, the gas composition around that region. And that's important because it sort of ties into the sort of like the dynamics of a disk, the dynamics of planet formation. Meteorites give us a ground truth. Mm-hmm. So you've got all these physicists doing these amazing calculations, modeling in three dimensions now how disks evolve, how they mix together. But then you've got to go back to the meteorites to go, do we see that? But they predict what we should see. So you're going and then we the... go back to the meteorite and go, do we see that in this rock? So in the grand scheme of, would we call it astrophysics right here? Or would it astro... What would we call this field? I think it, a, a nice umbrella term is planetary science. Because okay. it awesome. encompasses... Because like you you dip into a lot of those fields, like you dip yeah. into astrophysics, you dip into yeah. That's what I wasn't um, quite confident with naming. Uh, yeah, physics. Like, and I, I think that's the beauty of planetary science because, like, it's so people say, "Oh, what do you call yourself?" It's like I'm a, I'm a planetary geologist, but am I a cosmochemist? Because I look at a chemistry of the, pretty cool. or am I just yeah? Am I a planetary scientist? Because that's what I do. If a meteorologist. Do business cards, I study meteorites. Cosmic chemist. <laughs> cosmic <laughs> cosmic chemist for a business card. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so you're in the grand scheme of planetary science and determining where rocks came from and you know mm. the formation of the early universe and the origins. 
you would put yourself in the validation team, I suppose. Like you're there to validate models. You're there to yeah, get the data yeah. and parameters to validate mm. what you know people postulate, postulate and their hypotheses and yeah. stuff like that. Or maybe, so there's two ways. You're one's validating them. So going, okay, maybe this model, you've got two models to compare and you find an observation which completely rules one out and supports the other one. Then, yep. you can, then you're sort of validating. Another way is like, you've got all these models and then you go, okay, but I've, I've made this observation which indicates that at this point in time and space in the disk, the temperature was uh, this temperature, pressure was this pressure, and this was the gas composition. All these models might not all fall down, but you've mm. got to go, okay, these models now have to include in their code this pillar. This pillar has to happen because of what the meteorite record yeah. is telling us. And so then, like, so the idea of my PhD was to start building up a few pillars that we could go to back to these models and, and inform them to go, okay, you've got to jump through this hoop at this time and this hoop at this time. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, one of the first hoop I tried to nail down became very, very interesting and very, very cool, so I didn't do any of the other things I just went down this <laughs> rabbit hole um, basically looking at um, these tiny tiny nuggets um, made of really bizarre elements like osmium and rhenium and platinum really? Um, yeah and so, they came um, from meteorites? or uh, well they're, they're on earth they're mostly in the core because mm -hmm. um, uh, they're a group of elements called the highly siderophile elements so the what, sorry? highly siderophile highly a lot yeah cider iron File love, so really love metal. <laughs> <laughs> In a nutshell, um, cool. so there's this group of elements that just, if they have a choice to be anywhere, they'll be with the other metals, with iron, just sitting happily there. Mm. They really don't like playing with any other fate, so they don't like being part of sulfides that much. Um, they don't like being part of silicates or oxides. They just, they will if you're like given the right conditions, but most of the time. Under normal yeah. conditions, they want to be with the metal. One of the things uh, we were basically going to do is go, okay, in meteorites, these elements are hosted in this tiny little phase called refractory metal nuggets, which are like less than a micron. So some of them are like a hundredth of the width of your hair uh, in size. So we're going after really, really small grains. Um, and the other cool thing about these elements is they have really high condensation temperatures. So they'll condense out of a gas at about 1800 Kelvin, so not near, like nearly 2000 degrees wow. C, which is very hard, like that. those temperatures you don't normally see in the protoplanetary disk, apart from really close to the sun. Yeah. And so people have interpreted these like, as you, can, as you cool the disk close to the sun, these will be the first phases that form, and then other things will form around them, but these will be the first things. So if we can analyze these in detail, which is hard because they're so tiny. Yeah, so that was that was like the biggest challenge right at the beginning. How would um, you find them? So there was two cool tech, two approaches we used. Um, but maybe yeah. I should tell you what people used to do. Um, yeah, that's not fair. That's <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, people have known about these things since the seventies, where they were found um, sort of co simultaneously, which is kind of kind of cool. Those two people independently found the same thing at the same time, and uh, <laughs> and so really like cool. so it's kind of funny. It's like you got to sort of like, every time, every time, like yeah, said. right, yeah. Um, since then, it's kind of been people analyze maybe one one inclusion which had these um, phases in them, and there was only maybe like a handful of grains. That's not, again, like one or two grains and then making big sweeping interpretations about the early solar system. Is, is You can do it, but it's it's not as nice as having a big data set. Well, the, yeah, sample size doesn't yeah. matter. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. The other, the other way people used to do it is put a meteorite in a vat of acid and melt, like, uh, basically dissolve away all the normal mineral phases. And these things are so resistant to alteration, you just they just drop out at the end. So like the residue that was left behind after you dropped of meteorite and acid would be these little nuggets and so people analyzed could analyze then hundreds of these grains but would have no idea where in the rock it came from yep um and so there was always this assumption that they were associated with one type of inclusion only um a mineral uh, sort of inclusion called calcium aluminium inclusions mm -hmm. uh, named so because they have calcium and aluminium in them um, <laughs> and they are also really really all the mineral phases in there are really, really high temperature formation. So it was kind of a made sense story. You've got this metal grains which form at really high temperatures inside this inclusion, which also forms at really high temperatures. Mm -hmm. 
done. <laughs> um, it all works. We can start interpreting the early solar system close to the sun. So my approach was to go, okay, let's find try and find a bunch of these in the rock and get like over 100. Um, and so we used a combination of the Australian synchrotron in Melbourne, which um, is basically like taking a hammer to a problem. It's a really high-powered X-ray using particle accelerator. Okay. Um, so it allows you to rapidly map the chemistry of a thin section or a rock sample yeah. um, to That's really cool. high That's resolution. Cool. And it's really sensitive, as luck would have it, serendipity, um, to osmium and iridium. So it can get really low abundances of those grains. So then we go, okay, there's these bright hotspots of osmium and iridium. Mm. Let's go find them in like a scanning electron microscope so we can image them better. And lo and behold, we found uh, over 100 this way. Um, That's really cool. And what was good about it is uh, it was not, it wasn't based on human searching. It wasn't like, what's the right word? It was systematic. It was a systematic searching method. So it basically goes through the whole sample and picks out these hotspots. Yeah. And so you don't, you don't have to like worry about as a human getting fatigued as you search through a whole thin section, go, oh, did I really search that bit well enough? I know. Did I analyze every yeah. grain? So it kind of takes away that aspect of human error. It takes yeah, away yeah. the um, time that's associated yeah, often absolutely. with yeah, human labor. human hours, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, finding over 100. Um, and that was the when sort of the wheels started coming off the basically the current definition of these grains, because they said, oh, they're only supposed to be found in these high temperature phases. And we found them everywhere. So we found them throughout every inclusion in meteorites, huh. um, pretty much. And so that suddenly So what became, does that say? Well, that suddenly becomes very exciting, because if they're these high temperature phases, like yeah. we think, but they're distributed through every meteoritic component, then you've kind of got... Hmm, how to put this? You can either have two options, I guess. Like, either they formed in lots of different places. Uh-huh. And then you can start talking about the conditions in different places of the disk because different components formed in different places. And so instead of just talking about the inner disk, you're talking about the whole disk just from this tiny weeny phase in meteorites, which would be really cool. Um, but the more we kind of analysed them, we noticed that their chemistry was really bizarre. Like even within the same inclusion, these grains had different chemistries. And we tried all the established formation mechanisms that people have proposed. Yeah. Um, and sort of compared them to models, compared them to experiments um, that people had done and found that we couldn't, like this big, like basically like if you put it on a graph, it was just this shotgun of like compositions just all over the place. And so like you could draw lines for like condensation models and say, okay, these this group matches well. Um, with one formation theory, this one matches well with another formation theory, and this one matches well with this. Mm. But this region here in the graph doesn't match anything. Yeah. Um, try as we might, we couldn't think of a decent or a plausible mechanism in the disk to form these grains. And so we were left with this really exciting but also kind of uncomfortable conclusion going, okay, well, we've got this bizarre abundance like this diversity of compositions what if the solar system inherited that so solar system formed from what we think is a giant molecular cloud fragment uh, the things that form that giant molecular cloud are a bunch of stars that died um, just before our solar system formed so you've got stuff like supernova red giant stars yeah. adding different components into this giant molecular cloud yeah. If, the, if you form these grains, they're very hard to unform. And people have shown you can form them in the uh, atmospheres of stars um, through, like, uh, sort of modelling. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you form them, they're very hard to unform. So if you then inject those into the pre-solar system material and then the solar system doesn't completely overprint that, 
you, so what we could be it's seeing... It's like tracking mud through your house, almost. It doesn't form there. Yeah, But it's yeah. a pain in the ass to get rid of because you have to actually clean, physically move it or clean yeah, it. Yeah, so yeah. So, um, and maybe you're not the best over. cleaner in the world and just yeah. missed a few bits. Um, so, so yeah, that, so that are basically our hypothesis. Like, although some of these have clearly been affected by these nebular processes, we can explain quite a lot mm-hmm. of the grain compositions through nebular processes. Um, there's this group that don't fit any of that so potentially these could be pre-solar grains so what you've kind of gone on there science classically you know giving more questions than it actually answers during a process yeah yeah. (laughs) you've come out with i'm gonna be careful how i word this because i'm not entirely sure if it's correct either but a a new hypothesis to add on to what's already been uh the current knowledge in this field to say that the formation of a solar system wasn't an isolated event per solar system they may have just picked up materials from other solar systems that just got fed through or they um, weren't clean in their development or am I just going mm, at a wrong angle from this? I guess there's two things. It's not. An, I'm not saying anything new. People have suggested these things could be pre-solar before. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the things I'm trying to chase um, but no one's been able to do uh, just yet is the way to prove a pre-solar grain is a pre-solar grain is get its isotope, isotopic composition. And if a star, if a grain formed in like a supernova or any other stellar environment, its isotopes will be all over the shop, nothing like anything we see on Earth. Uh, unfortunately, because these grains are so small, uh, we haven't been able to apply a, sen- a technique that's sensitive enough yeah. to get at that. People have tried and sort of come out with solar abundances and go, oh, they're solar, but you actually look at the resolution of their analysis and go, well, actually, you can't rule out every... The sensitivity isn't good enough to say this is 100% a solar system yeah. grain, it, there's still a chance that it could be. Uh, I guess the other thing is, it's feeding into that assumption, because most people assume that the protoplanetary disk is completely homogenous. Yep. So, well mixed, you blended everything really well, and then all the diversity we see afterwards is due to other processes. Um, we know that kind of ne- might not necessarily be true because we have pre-solar grains in meteorites. So, these, by necessity, have to have survived that mixing process in the disk um, down to like things that are really quite delicate like organics um, so organic material yeah, we have some that's a pre-solar in origin um, and you almost do anything to that um, cooking above a few hundred degrees and it disappears gets completely equilibrated with the bulk background of solar system so I guess it's sort of feeding into that notion that maybe some grains we have that don't necessarily look like traditional pre-solar grains um, might be have a pre-solar origin and just weren't completely reset in the solar mm. system. Um, so it's not so much that we're sort of contaminated by dirty solar systems, but like we did, we inherited a bunch of stuff from the stars that came before. Did the processes in the disk completely wipe out all signal of that? Um, and then you go one way in your modeling. Yeah. And if not, then you go the other way. You go the other way um, and see. Oh, okay, what? How do we incorporate that into our models? How allows for a bit more direction. When yeah. It comes to the analysis. Basically, means we know we didn't have a really hot disk. Yeah. Throughout the whole outer asteroidal distances, because if you did, you'd completely destroy every when, pre-solar grain. And when you say disk here, you're referring to oh yeah. <laughs> That's right. And you've mentioned lots. I wasn't too sure if I've missed it or not. But when you say disk, are you referring to the formation of our sun? I guess like solar systems formed by the collapse of like a giant cloud of gas yeah um that has a net rotation um and so as that collapses in due to its gravity uh sort of imagine like tucking your arms in on a roundabout yeah you go faster so that net rotation spins and spin uh sort of speeds up and basically the effect is it flattens out uh into a disc structure like a yeah. pancake um with a dense core in the middle which is the forming sun um, as soon as that gets dense enough and hot enough, nuclear fusion kicks off and you have a T Tauri star or a proto star. Yeah. Um, and then more and more material builds on top of that and eventually builds um, a main sequence star with a disk around it, which is like accreting your planets and um, gas giants and all those kind of um, celestial bodies. So, so yeah, it's basically the, when I talk about the disk, it's sort of like that moment, that structure that forms just after. Uh, basically ignition starts in the star you've got a disc surrounding it swirling around yeah. um, so it's like the initial conditions for the form yeah, yeah. I, I really probably should have said that way earlier 
Uh, so one question I would like to know, something that a few people have always asked me to ask people who have had experiences in two different countries. Yeah. How have you found the research environment from Australia in comparison to the UK? I mean, they're different, <laughs> but in both in good ways. So um, uh, what I found uh, in Australia um, at large is a lot more laid back. Um, okay. You do still do like really good science. Like that's not to say like you're chill and you're muddling through. Yeah, of um, course. You still produce amazing things like Wi-Fi. <laughs> um, um, but it does give you a much better work-life balance. Um, I mean, that might just have been my previous experience was at Imperial College London, and yeah, it was very much like the way universities get their standings is their researchers and academics are pumping out high yeah. impact journals just all the time. Um, and it's like very much the publish and perish aspect. So it puts a lot of stress on academics to get research out there. Also kind of risks the quality of the actual Absolutely, research. yeah, yeah. Um, sort of people have been, lots of papers have been written recently about sort of like natural selection in academia. Like are we selecting mm. for good science or sensationalist science just to get these high-impact papers? And follow-up studies aren't promoted because... Where do you get the funding to do something that someone's already done to check that it's still... There was a recent assessment of papers as well that found that yeah. there were, I want to say fake, but uh, poor quality science that was published mm. in journals. And so yeah. they, they're saying it's for that reason, but mm. they're yeah, yeah. having to retract these yeah, papers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, so, yeah, and in fact, that's the most important bit about science is the double check. Yeah. It's all very well to go, okay, like, with my stuff, it's like, huh, that's odd. Yeah. I want to go analyze that further and take that further and do my tests again. Which is why the methodology sure. is there. So even yeah. if you, someone else found it and that's odd, yeah. they can be like, mm, I want to do this myself. I don't quite know if that's right. And they do it themselves yeah. and they're like, oh, mm. yeah. okay, that is great. And that, that's not, I think the best thing about science, people always often forget, like, um, people I think like to have their bit that they contributed. Yeah. Um, my personal view is I would love to, well, a, I'd love to have this long, glorious career in academia. Wouldn't that be uh, Wouldn't it be nice? I mean, it's a hyper-competitive field. I'm inordinately lucky to have got this postdoc position. They're like finding a needle in a haystack. Um, you've got to be the blue-eyed, back-flipping, rainbow-coloured unicorn um, to Welcome. get those positions. <laughs> um, because they're so rare. And even then, it's like there are 101 other people who are just as qualified, if not better than you. So it's kind of luck of the draw. But I would love to like be in my 80s and have some upstart PhD student prove my entire life's work wrong. I think that would be the best thing ever. <laughs> It'd be glorious. It'd be like, oh yeah, cool. Um, I tried. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Turns out my whole career, not a failure, just not overly successful. Well, I wouldn't say it's not successful. It's like my work inspired someone enough that they cared enough to go tear it down. No, okay. I can't really go with that. I can um, and that's how we move forward. So I've made some observations. That's a fantastic made my... personality and attitude towards science. Like, <laughs> sci scientists are biased, and the scientific method method is there to try and filter that bias and make it a bit more rigorous. And yeah, yeah. I suppose the process, like, get it scrutinized by your supervisors. You publish it. You get it peer reviewed, and then after you get the peer review, you've got like the community which scrutinize it. And mm, if yeah. As a scientist, you should be open to the scrutiny. You should be open-minded yeah. and be like, actually, that's a point I never considered. Mm. I probably should look into that just in yeah. case. Yeah. Um, well, like, a uh, perfect example of that, um, I've got a, a guy who's a, a friend working, um, working over in Germany. We both look at these grains that I've been talking about. And, like, he's a lovely guy. We've had really great, great chats, really great scientific back and forth emails. We fundamentally disagree how these things fall. <laughs> um, uh, he thinks they fall one way, I think they fall my way. He's got some nice observations supporting his, I've got some nice observations supporting me. We just have these great chats. Um, and like, either way, it's kind of cool. Um, mm. If one of us is right, one of us is wrong, we still learn more about our solar system. And that's what it should be about, really. Like, yeah, um, the, great, the bigger picture as opposed to individual ego. Or something yeah, like absolutely. That. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, like I would adore it if everything I ever publish is wrong. <laughs> that's fantastic. Do you have any closing notes before we finish off? Anything you'd like to mention or advocate for? Uh, anyone listening who's thinking like, hey, yeah, um, I want to be an academic. I want to be a planetary scientist. Um, I want to be a that, cosmic chemist. Or a cosmo geochemist. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. It's like it's a really hard job. It's because you, you've always got to be thinking up something brand new. 
But at the same time, it's the most rewarding thing you can do. So it's always worth just trying it. Yeah, you can yeah. always always back out, go on to do other things. Um, but just having that exposure to and finding that mindset of just going, okay, what's the data say? How does it express itself? And what does that mean? And then be able to talk about some fundamental process or law of nature is just glorious. So, <laughs> um, so my mantra has basically been like, I really love, adore what I do. And I'm just going to keep trying to do it until someone says no. <laughs> um, <laughs> and no one says no them. yet. And I wish you the best of luck with you. <laughs> never in that field or down yeah. that path, I suppose. Thanks very much. And that's it from us today. Thank you very much for checking out our show. I hope you learned something new. Again, if you haven't checked out any of our other shows, please jump back on the archive and see what if there's anything else there that's your cup of tea. I'm sure you'll find something. There are some fantastic guests. If you would like to feature on another episode of Vaguely Accurate, then be sure to contact us. I'm extremely friendly. <laughs> there's no theme to be shy or timid about it. And lastly, get in touch with us on social media if you have any questions or you'd like to start a discussion about the topics covered in this show. Contact us. Anyway, have a good day, guys. Take care of yourselves. Goodbye.